And welcome in to another episode of Tiger Territory, a Detroit Tigers podcast, part of the Foul Territory Network. I'm Kieran Steckley. With me, as always, is a man who Jake Paul wouldn't dare try to fight. He is Cody Stavenhagen. How you doing? I like that. I thought we were going to have a Jake Paul Tyson <laughs> reference. What a waste of everyone's time. I'm going to be honest. I watched it. I also want to start this episode with two public service announcements. Number one, if you are watching this on YouTube, See that little subscribe button right below the box? If you could give that a click, that would be awesome. Really helps us out because we're at the mercy of like the algorithm gods and stuff like that. But trying to grow the official subscriber base. Number two, Detroiters. Uh, this might be a sensitive subject, but I think we got to stop with the Jared Goff chance at non-Lions events. All right. We saw it throughout the Tigers season. So it was it, almost mockingly like when the Tigers were playing poorly. But then they're good in the playoffs, and you're still like changing the name of a football player. I didn't quite get it. I, I guess it's like a cool rallying cry for the city. But I went to a concert this past week. Wyatt Flores, Stillwater's own. Check it out if you haven't. Um, everyone's chanting Jared Goff. And this poor kid is like, what is going on? He like takes out his earpiece. He's like, what? And then I maybe he should be a bigger football fan. I don't know. But then he's like, uh, you, you guys know my name's Wyatt, right? And he was joking. But it was like a reflection of a thought I had already had. I think we just got to start limiting it to Lions games. All right. I, well, we're going to start off the pod with a slight disagreement. I'm all for it. I, I do think it is symbolic of the city and the city's journey uh, and the city you know, on the come up uh, for all sports teams as well. Uh, I don't think it has anything to do specifically to Jared, Jared Goff at this point and the Lions at this point. I think most people who complain about it are those kinds of fans that are fans of various Detroit teams, but were too cool to be Lions fans when they sucked. <laughs> That's my opinion. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's symbolic of the city. I mean, if we're going to go down that like strict verbatim, are we going to stop playing Journey because of the South Detroit thing? No, so, that's like, stupid. Anyone who has a problem with that is just like trying to sound smart. Okay, well, there you go. I, I kind of look at them at the same. Like, I, I think it's, I think a lot of people who complain about it just don't like the Lions or are bitter that, like, they're, they're good now. They don't have to hold that over, like, their fellow Michiganders. That's my opinion. So, if you, if you think that, that I'm way off, hit me up on X at Kieran underscore Seckley. Tell me how wrong I, wrong if I am. I think we don't disagree enough. Here you go. We could have a heated episode on this whole topic. <laughs> Instead, I guess we'll talk about the Tigers. We'll talk. We'll talk about the Tigers. Uh, speaking of the YouTube, though, if you have not gone and listened to our interview with AJ Hinch, first of all, please do wherever you get your podcast. Secondly, it is on YouTube as well, so you can watch us interview AJ. AJ gracious enough to give us thirty plus minutes of his time. I thought he was. Uh, I thought he was awesome. Like you know, you talk to him all the time, Cody. So it's a little bit different for you, but for me, like that was my first time. You know, quote unquote meeting AJ uh but he he felt like the same I felt like I was talking to a guy I knew and I mean that as a compliment you know to him because the way he presents himself to the media and to fans and all that stuff um as, as I as I reflect on the interview I I did kind of want to highlight a couple things little teasers in case somebody hadn't gotten a chance to go back it was a end of week episode if you would he he talked about the Tigers being young and and you know kind of the experience that came with that, but he, he did admit that you know he kind of did feel like the team was like a little tight there in Game Five of of the ALDS, which I would consider myself in the ninety nine percentile of reading and listening to things that AJ Hinch says publicly. I don't know if I had ever heard him say that before. If, if he did say it, then uh, then I apologize. But uh, I thought that was a a frank omission. And also representative of where the Tigers were at, where they're currently at, and where they're trying to get to. Another example of, you know, the steps that it takes to be a perennial, we'll say contender, perennial contender. Uh, and that was one of the steps, as much as it hurt at the time. And I thought, it, I thought it was a frank assessment of what it means to be young and then, like, being able to take opportunities to grow. So that was one of my like bigger takeaways as you reflect on it, Cody, what was kind of something that stood out for you? Yeah. I think there were a few just little tidbits, like even the, that being tight before a game five thing was just kind of a one-off little comment. But when you, when I heard it, I, my, I did perk up like, Oh, like 
that's kind of new. It wasn't something that had been said before. Uh, we didn't necessarily go into this interview trying to like make headlines because it's the off season. We just wanted to have a frank conversation with AJ and grilling him about like what moves the front office might <laughs> be to do much good. And given it's the off season, like the top goal team stuff, we didn't want to repeat too much. So uh, especially as someone who talks to him all the time, I enjoyed just some of the more random topics that came up, you know, ejections, which I was just making a joke. And I thought he gave a really, I knew this just knowing AJ, but I'd never heard him outright say like one reason he doesn't like getting ejected is he can't manage the game. You know, your job is to be the guy in the center of the dugout in the biggest moment. And you can't do that. If you're getting tossed over a borderline ball strike call, I thought that was awesome. I thought toward the end, his reflections on his high school football career were awesome. Um, know a lot about this dude. I didn't know he had, briefly like considered being part of the Stanford football team or like Bill Walsh wanted him. On what a name drop, by the way. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> so yeah, I mean that that was it, it was it was fun to just kind of talk, you know, really for lack of a better term, talking ball with AJ as opposed to like, you know, decisions this, decisions that, front office, like, you know, blah blah blah. I thought he kind of gave us a good scope into you know, the way he looks at the game, I thought his answer was Scott about his relationship with Scott Harris was good about like, you know, and then him saying that he was like, I don't know if he used the word thankful, but more or less like thankful that Scott like gave him the extension. So they're, they're in it together as opposed to this kind of yeah, like, Kieran, that was another interesting one too. And like, I, you know, you'd refer to it as an arranged marriage. I don't think that's entirely the case because AJ, he didn't hire Scott, but he certainly played a role in the hiring and interviewing process of these general managers. Like I'm sure he could have vetoed it if it were, or at least expressed disagreement if they were going to hire someone he like just didn't like. So like, I think he was a hundred percent on board, but he said, he basically admitted like the partnership with Scott reached another level after the contract extension. That was just another little thing that made me think, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. And as, as we look back at like things that led to the Tigers being on the cusp of the ALCS, like that might be almost like move number one is after the, the previous season, the, the the president of baseball ops and the general man or excuse me and the manager align extension everything's good they you know they had all this unbridled uh optimism at that presser uh for good reason and then the season plays out the way it did like it does kind of like it, it makes sense you know if you put it on a timeline uh and and great timing for us too we had them on the day before or excuse me the day after uh he was named a finalist for the uh, AL manager of the year award. Uh, one that like you had to keep in mind, the tigers were more cute story at the time. These votes were cast than Oh, we're looking at, you know, national conversation. We're looking at them as potentially, you know, one of the, you know, contenders teams that can kick down the door in the American league, essentially. So like it, it again, it makes sense now, but at the time it was like, all right, what are the Tigers really going to go down to Houston, a team that's been to the CS like seven consecutive years or whatever, and and beat them? Like, of course not. But they did, they did in two games. So uh, you got to keep that in mind with these votes. This is a vote that you have, Cody. Uh, obviously, we can't talk specifics until the uh, results are announced. But I think it might be good to kind of like look at AJ and and Stephen Vogt and uh, and Matt Quantrero and just that's Quatraro. Royal Quatraro. What was it? Quatraro. Quatraro. Sorry. Uh, it's all in the same division, by the way. So that, that's 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 pretty fun for the AL Central or disastrous if you're a, a, a White Sox fan. But anyway, uh, so you just kind of break down this vote for us, if you would, a little bit. Yeah, it's a, a really difficult decision, especially manager of the year, kind of this nebulous award where there's no real set criteria for. So when you have, you know, generally, we all know this kind of often goes to like whose team exceeded expectations the most. Well, you had three of them all in the AL Central that greatly exceeded expectations. Vote in his first year's manager wins the division, the Royals with a historic turnaround, and the Tigers with a historic. Uh, final two months run to the postseason. So it's not like you can go on fan grabs and like sort by war and like sort it out that way. 
you uh, and 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 I'll be honest, it's a little hard. I especially because they're in the same division. I've seen all these teams a lot, but you don't watch them every day. So I thought all these guys were equally deserving. I really tried to think, okay, like who, based on what we know, like really manage their team the best. And that's a difficult question too, because the Royal, you know, like vote definitely got creative. He had, it, it didn't get as much pub and wasn't quite to the extreme of the tigers, but had to get very creative uh, with his pitching. They do some interesting in-game things as well. Like Q, um, they, it is a hard name to get out of your mouth. A lot of people in baseball just call him Q. So we'll, we'll go with that. Um, you know, the Royals, like a roster that wasn't expected to be much. And although that pitching staff ended up being legit, uh, played greater to the sum of its parts. And we all know, um, you know, about the story of the Tigers. So I don't want to swing the gambling lines too much here. But I'll just say it was a really difficult decision. Um, and at the same time, I wonder if AJ faces a little bit of an uphill battle just because the kind of, as you alluded to, like the national narrative was kind of set around vote and around Quatraro. And AJ kind of entered the picture like late. And I think a lot of people nationally who might be voting on this award didn't really take the Tigers seriously until like they beat the Astros in the playoffs. Um, so I'll be super curious to see how this shakes out. Um, I think all three are very deserving finalists. And in a normal year, any of these three might be like a runaway winner. Yeah, well, we will react to that uh, after the results are... Are, are announced and then we can uh, get Cody to uh, reveal his vote. So let's go to sort of the underneath surface a little bit of, of the Tigers organization. Jose, Josue Persino. I'm having a hard time with the names today. Jose oh, Persino. You, you, you did pretty good on that one. Okay. Uh, Triple crown. That was already. And then just last night announced that he is the MVP of the Arizona fall league. Not any surprise to anyone who is on X, formerly known as Twitter, and has the Tigers algorithm because uh, I'm not sure there's an hour that's gone by. I haven't seen some sort of highlight from Josue, and uh, and he has become sort of the, I would say, like the apple in the eye of those that really follow like farm systems for the tig- for Tigers fans. Uh, Lorenzo definitely qualifies as that. Max Clark is in that conversation. McGonagall is in that conversation, but Rosinho was one that we were kind of waiting to see a little bit from. He was hurt this year. And then if this is a representative of what he can do when he starts to put it together, uh, it's very exciting. And also if you're looking for some international signees to work out, here's your kind of in the system leader in the clubhouse. I know there are some guys that have gotten up to the majors, but you know, in terms of in the depths of the system, here's your guy. Uh, so great for him. I don't have a lot of analysis. I'm not breaking these things down, but, uh, I think it's, it's a, it's another case of, if you believe in this sort of thing, organizational momentum. So the team makes it almost to the ALCS. AJ Hinch is a nominee for manager of the year and, or finalist, I should say. And then Josue is AFL MVP. So like, you know, good for him. I think it's actually sort of like a great example of what Baseball America put out, which is that the Tigers, based on whatever metric they use, I think it's hit plus. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to. I'm not going to be able. I'm not going to pretend to be able to break everything down for for you guys. That's their work. I want you to go read their stuff. But is a metric they use for you know measuring hitting development across all farm systems, and they had the Tigers as the best of 2024 in this uh, in this particular area. So. Things coming up, Detroit, Cody, uh, for for this team and this organization. And again, these are the kinds of things that Scott Harris, you yawn, you being the you, the general you, you yawn at when he talks about the organization and you know, you know, resources. These are the kinds of things that he is looking towards. So, not something that we can like break down in depth, but obviously a good thing for the organization. Yeah, I think like this topic is still so dangerous prospects aren't necessarily my specialty for this exact reason. Like you just don't know. Right. At the same time, you look at all the evidence of good things happening on the tiger's farm system. And you can't deny that, you know, Persino, this is a guy who's been on people's radar for a while. I, I remember in spring training, it was, well, it was AJ and she was like, have you guys seen Persino? I was like, I don't know. Oh, like he, he can hit or no. He's like, have you physically seen him? 
I was like, no. And then uh, that was a couple days before the um, prospect game. He's like, just look at like this guy is built like a Greek god, you know, and he is. And I was like, oh, I see. And then he stung a couple of balls that day, and I was like, oh, okay. And he ended up being kind of one of the talks of camp. Obviously, when he was healthy, went on to have a pretty solid season and really took off here in the Arizona Fall League. Seems like maybe even though he's young for that, that you know, facing some pitchers with more experience, it wasn't like the greatest pitching in the Arizona Fall League. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, the hit plus thing is really interesting because even though there were some very positive developments, obviously McGonagall, Lorenzo, some others, you know, I think most people, myself included, still view the Tigers as being better at developing pitching than they are hitting. Like, and you know, it's going to take some time to get more proof of that to come up through the system. Uh, but one thing I've said for years is like, you just need someone to pop. You need that random person to pop on the hitting side. Maybe an international guy, which they haven't had basically ever. Um, and I don't know if this means Brasino is going to become a superstar, but he's starting to look like that type of international prospect who wasn't that highly heralded, who might be popping a little bit. And that's something that uh, the best teams just tend to have, and the Tigers are long overdue for. So uh, going to be super interested to see what's next in Josue Brasino's future. Yeah, and I think he was 800000 uh was was the was yeah. the price that the uh, memory serves so uh that was i believe that was the year that it was still like sort of like the spread it out uh mantra of the front office and and i will say this just in general like there's it's been a while probably not in the social definitely not in the social media era that the tigers have had as an organization have had a team worth watching in the majors and several really interesting intriguing like what if prospects in the uh you know in the minors definitely not in the social media era because they've been top heavy one way or uh right. or, or the other pretty much since uh since we started being on i, I, I think that's an time. interesting thing too is like we're starting to see this talent spread out over multiple levels where for a while it was like oh torque uh green and dingler are all at eerie like that's awesome oh mize and uh, Fiedo and Manning and Scooble are all at Erie. And now it's like, well, you're going to have Max Clark and McGonagall and Double A. You're going to have, you know, some of these, maybe Lorenzo, uh, Versino and High A West Michigan. You still have, you know, you're going to have the guys coming up. Bryce Rayner probably playing in Lakeland. Um, obviously, you, you know, maybe don't quite have that guy knocking on the door in Toledo. Although I guess Jackson Job could maybe fit that bill. So, I think that's a little bit of a difference than maybe what we've seen with the top heavy systems in years past. That's a good point. It is pretty, one could say they have optionality. All right, well, we're moving on. Uh, <laughs> speaking of optionality, there was, there was some news this week that didn't directly, uh, impact the Tigers, but it was enough to get that get us going a little bit. And that is the Philadelphia Phillies, a team that considers themselves would you call it World Series or bust? Would you call it the Philly in their own mind? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Thousand okay. percent. All right. Let's make sure I went out of line there. World Series or bust. And they have themselves a uh I'm guessing a desire to sign Alex Bregman. Problem is they have a third baseman. His name is Alec Bohm. Did I get it right? Nailed it. All right, boom. Uh, so so Alec plays third base. He was an all-star this year, but Jeff Passan puts in his like off-season notes column slash news tidbits, and then Buster only separately uh, reports that like they're looking to slash likely will trade Alec Boom. So I got to doing some research. I have several stats and and things that we can go into but your initial reaction because I, I sent this to you right away obviously we know the tigers have a need to upgrade at the corner corners this is a guy who is a third baseman he has played some first base didn't really play last year because obviously you can't play bryce harper anywhere but first base with the with the tommy john or at least he didn't want to wh whichever one you want to believe uh <laughs> he is 28 so there's the age thing he's got two years of team control coming up so uh, those are just kind of like the very basic stuff there. But when you 
when because you're trying to train yourself like Scott Harris right now. When you see like a name come up, does this does the is this a potential match? I, I think it is, and that doesn't mean anything's inevitable. And I'm not reporting anything, but it's one of those things that comes out, and you're like, hmm, interesting. And there will probably be multiple teams interested in Bohm, but he fits the bill of a right-handed third baseman, someone who could help the Detroit Tigers improve. Um, I think the number one thing I like about Bohm is, you know, very low whiff rates, very low K rates. Doesn't walk a ton, a ton, but has a knack for putting the ball in play. Obviously, he's coming off the best year of his career. Not a perfect player. Like the numbers kind of vary on him at third base. He graded out terribly in years past and was closer to league average this past year. So, like, those are some definitely some of the things that sticks out. He hit lefties very well this past season. I think the question becomes like, okay, what do the Phillies want? And I don't think it's nothing that the Tigers under the Scott Harris regime have a history of trading with Dave Dombrowski and the Phillies. Scott, although it seems like he did okay at this past year's trade deadline, doesn't have a reputation for being like the easiest um, executive to trade with. One guy he hasn't had a problem completing deals with is Dave Dombrowski. So could that help there be a match? And if so, what are the Phillies like? What is a fair return? There's a guy coming off a three and a half win season, but he doesn't really have that track record. Like I don't think he should command the pure value of like a perennial three to four win player. So you start looking at, it, it's like, okay, well like who, who makes sense? They probably need some pitching, right? Like just, would they want Casey Mize? Like, I, I don't know. I mean, David Chad's in that system. Let's keep that in mind too, but that's not enough for Bohm. Okay. Throw in who's a tradable prospect, Jace Young. Well, they don't really need Jace Young. Also Young and Mize, like that starts to seem like too much. Um, so like a, a, a pitcher who could help their pin and like a lower level. I don't know. I, I struggle like finding that deal that makes total sense. So I actually, one of my, one of the things I don't try to do a lot is sort of like make trades out of thin air because it's, especially from like, they're always wrong. <laughs> well, they're always wrong. But from my perspective, like if you're a Tigers fan, you're looking to see what the, you could trade for Alec. It's like, you're going to give guys you don't like, you know what I mean? Like that's how, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That, that's how it's going to exactly. be. And then you're not going to want to put somebody in there that you probably would need to put in there in order to make the deal happen. Uh, like could Matt, Ma like Matt Manny, like it just like, I'm just like throwing names out. Uh, the Jace young thing. I, I agree with you. I don't think they see a huge need. In fact, I would probably argue like trading for Alec almost gives you Jace Young like like insurance for his timeline. Basically, right, I agree. Uh, like I think, it, and by the way, that could be a nice that could be a nice combination in some way of options that have. Not to say they'd be like you know splitting time or anything, but you see what I'm saying. Uh, you don't have to rush Young up, whereas right now, you know, the jury's still out on whether he's like majorly ready or whatever. So. Uh, so that's, that's, that's like the exercise I try not to dive too much into, but I do try to see if I can interpret like the actions and why things are out. So, and in case of Alec, it seems pretty clear. Like they keep, they keep saying like the Phillies need to shake it up. And uh, like, you know, the, 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 the results have not, you know, that hasn't been good enough or whatever in the owner's eyes. This is a spot that they could easily upgrade via free agency. So if they, but they just have to create the spot for like, again, a potentially like a, a Bregman type or whatever. And that makes Alec in a way somewhat uh, disposable. So, but he was an all-star, but he was a three war player. And so there, I, there's a little bit of a tug of war narrative wise to try to figure out, is this a sell high because he was an all-star or it sounds like, but, but at the same time, it's like, but you clearly want to get rid of him. Like you clearly do not like, you feel like you're in a better opportunity to do X than have him in the lineup. So you can't be selling that high on him. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Like, I don't think this is a traditional sell high from like a first time all-star and, you know, two, two, uh, like I said, two years of team control. That's, those are intriguing things. Um, uh, I, like I said, I wrote down some stats here. I'll kind of 
go off him so in case people don't necessarily understand like what kind of player he is here's something that can uh that can help you know shape a picture a little bit so he had a 45.8 percent hard hit rate that was 41st in major league baseball uh, a little perspective riley green is 47.1 the league average is 39 so he's an above average hard hit guy poll percentage 21.9 poll percentage that's way down that's like 123 among qualified batters that's essentially matt veerling who is 23.4 uh league average is 30 by the way 30 and change win probability added at the plate this is just offense he's 1.4 which is 52nd in baseball. Parker Meadows is 1.1 70. So I'm giving these comparisons. I think, that, I think it's a good stat that we need to start using more too. Win probability added. Yeah, I agree. Uh, walk percentage, you touched on it. He doesn't walk a ton, 6.6%. That's pretty low, but that's basically Colt Keith. Colt Keith was 6.5. Uh, league average is 8.2% walk rate. So that's that. Batting average on balls in play. Batted 304. Batting average on balls in play which is basically Colt Keith, who three, uh, 306 batting average on balls in play. The league average is 291. So those guys are, uh, are slightly above average, obviously. And defensively, uh, there's a million ways you can kind of go about this, but I just kind of picked two. He, he's zero defensive run saved above average. This is on baseball reference, in case anybody's curious. But he was plus three fielding runs above average. So there you go. There's there's a little – and Andy Abanez was too. That's specific to third base, obviously. So so there's a little bit of a picture. So he hits the ball similarly, a little bit less than Riley Green, hard. He pulls it about the same as Matt Beerling. He, is, he adds wins at almost the same rate as Parker Meadows, or Parker's a little bit below. He walks about the same as Colt Keith. His batting average on balls in play is about the same as Colt Keith and Matt Beerling, by the way, 303. And he is, depending on what metric you use, an average, a tick above, a tick below average fielder. Which, by the way, has some first base capability. So if you're looking for some, what are we going to do about torques insurance, is a guy who can play first base. So, and he has pedigree too. He was a third overall pick, I believe. So, like, if that matters to people, that that's part of his profile as well. Yeah, and we should probably note there have been, how do we want to phrase it, like reported character concern i don't know if maturity it's i think concerns, like maturity concerns which i don't want to speculate on too much i don't know the guy i haven't met the guy maybe worth taking into consideration scott harris has kind of talked about you don't really want to mess up what's a really good team chemistry right now um but he'd be coming to a much easier market to play in. i think a lot of that stems from his like back and forth with phillies fans a couple years ago somebody he knows and Matt Veerling. I have no idea if they're like boys or not. Maybe like, maybe they're the opposite. I have no idea, but eh, maybe that could help a, a familiar face. Um, just like, I don't think that that would be like a deal breaker. I don't think unless, you know, there's more out there than we, we are really aware of, or maybe it just lowers the price. So. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do want to compare Bohm to another third baseman who's popped up um, in kind of trade, rumors recently and that is jake berger of the miami marlins and i think this makes me like alec bohm more because berger i get why he's his name is out there he plays for an organization that is just probably mostly focused on cutting payroll that's not going to be very hard to deal with they're probably not going to ask a lot and i believe he only has one remaining year of team yep. control so a lot of incentive to uh is that right? I don't think that's right. He doesn't actually have that much service time. That is false. He's not a free oh, agent until 2029. No, I, was look, I was looking at the wrong thing. My bad. Mm, you've led me astray. That's all right. Okay, so scratch that. I still think it'd be possible to deal. That makes him more attractive. The Tigers could have him for longer. There's some things I really don't like about him, though. Like Bohm, he doesn't walk a lot. 5.4% walk rate. Unlike Bohm, he strikes out quite a bit. 25.9 and he whiffs a lot he just has not put the ball in play near as much as Alec Bohm now there is more of a power ceiling this guy had 34 homers two years ago 29 this past year um that's enough to to certainly be intriguing but at least last season he's a right-handed hitter who did not actually hit lefties very well 678 OPS against left-handed pitching he was actually better against righties uh so I don't think the Tigers would like that 
I think we're starting, like, I think there's still too much swing and miss in this Tigers order, even under the dominate the strike zone mantra. And with the game seemingly shifting back to a little bit more contact oriented, like Tigers need to improve their team speed and put the ball in play more like Berger just does not help you with that mission. And a bit like Bohm, it's kind of tough to know what to make of him defensively. He's graded out um, negative in both outs above average and defensive runs saved for each of the past three years. I don't think he's atrocious, but based on these numbers, he is at least below average. Um, so, like, the idea of adding the power bat is naturally intriguing, but the rest, especially in comparison with Bohm, I actually don't like Jake Berger very much as a fit for the Tigers. Yeah, and I, I, I still do value like intangible stuff. And I now Bohm batted two fourteen. He's got two fourteen career postseason hitter. So it's not like he has like this great experience of success or whatever. But he has been a part of teams that have obviously been perennial playoff teams and made it to the World Series. So like I, if you're a Tigers team that's trying to get over the next step, there is a world where adding a player like Bohm like helps you sort of mature as a team, which again, we're talking about his maturity, but mature as a team and be able to find guys that have had success and, and go and been a part of like, you know, starting, you know, in the world series or whatever, like been, been a part of teams that have reached a certain task. You know what I mean? Like if there's maturity issues there that I guess that negates it a little bit, but that's alleged. I'm not saying one way or another, but he is a guy that comes from a good organization. Obviously. Kieran, what if there were a third baseman out there who has a track record of offensive success, postseason success, and he's played gold glove defense? Would that be a good fit for the Tigers, you think? Would he possibly have played for the Tigers manager? I think he, I think I, maybe so. Maybe so. Sounds we're like talking about run. Alex Bregman, people. He's going to be, he's going to be expensive. But all these other names we're going to mention are flawed in one way or another. Alex Bregman, he may not be perfect. He may not be great in five or six years. But if you're looking for the perfect fit, I think it's out there. That's another thing, too. The perfect fit, especially in the trade market, is pretty relative because there's always a reason somebody is trading somebody. You know, you know, like there's there's, you know, whether it's to do with them or their organization. But uh but like Juan Soto would never be traded if he was on like a perennial good team with deep pockets, right? Like that's that that's a fact that he's not traded because of his ability. Uh, so anyway, all right, that was fun, fun little discussions there as we get near Thanksgiving. Uh, anything else, Cody? Before we get out of here? No, I think that will cover it. We'll see you guys again later this week. Like I said, want to ask an ask reminder if you're watching us on YouTube, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you are listening to us on wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple, and elsewhere, please subscribe, five-star review if you feel so inclined. We're getting getting off the ground here, and we appreciate all the kind words and support that we have received. And if you haven't listened to AJ Hinch yet, go back and listen or watch it on YouTube. It was a lot of fun, uh, and we'll have, we're will have we working on more interviews with guys that we find uh, either important or interesting or both. So there you go. That's kind of our criteria for uh, for people to come on the show. So like I said, follow Cody on Twitter at Cody Statement Hagen. I am at Kieran underscore Steckley. Pod page is Tiger Territory underscore. So for Cody Statement Hagen, I am Kieran Steckley. Everybody have a great week.